Well, speaking of the, the scriptures, we want to go to God's Word today as we are continuing through the book of 1 Corinthians. If you have your Bible, you can take them out, or if you have an app or whatever you're using. If you don't have anything, that's okay. We have the words on the screen. Those of you that are tuning in on the live stream, you'll see the words there as well on the screen. But we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're going to be reading verses 8 through 13 this morning. Uh, we're doing the second part of a, a series on uh, what is love, or this is what is known as the love chapter in chapter 13. And so we're going to pick up once again on this same theme. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8, Paul says this, Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Let's pray as we seek the Lord during this time together. Lord, we want to just come to your word now. And as we study your word today, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would guide us in the truth. And the Lord today, that we would be equipped to serve as you've called each of us. That we would love people. And that we would be concerned for their eternal destiny. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would do a work in us today. Lord, we lay ourselves before you and we ask that you would transform us so that we would be more and more like Jesus. Lord, we praise you and we worship you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it is uh, tax season again. I know I just uh, got my taxes in yesterday, but uh, this time every year, uh, everybody's trying to get their taxes filed before the April deadline. I heard in the news reports that they may extend it again this year. Who knows how that's going to happen? But I know for a lot of us, this is kind of a time of scrambling to get everything together. I know it brings each of us great joy to pay our taxes to Uncle Sam. Uh, not <laughs> hardly. Uh, but we do this as citizens, as Americans. We pay our taxes. You know, it's been said in this world, nothing can be certain except death and taxes. Uh, well, that's a rather pessimistic way of looking at things, but I understand the sentiment that's there. Uh, death and taxes seem to be something that we can't escape uh, in life. Sort of like gravity, it's just the way things are. But I'm thankful in heaven that there will be neither death or taxes. Amen to that? <laughs> There's going to be no taxes there. But you know, some things in life we think are going to be there forever. There are some things that we think that are going to last as we go on, like death and taxes. There's, that's going to be just a reality that we have to deal with. But there are some things, in fact, most things are temporary, but there are a few things that are eternal. And one of those things that we're going to see this morning that is eternal is love. And you remember last week we began this chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, what, as I mentioned, is already known as the love chapter. And just to give you a little bit of a context for those of you that have uh, missed uh, the last couple of weeks, Paul is writing a church in Corinth that needed to learn the more excellent way of love. Evidently, factions and divisions had emerged among some of the members, and some even felt that because they had this special gifting from the Lord, that they didn't need the help of other people. And so Paul is reminding them that love must be essential to every attitude and action and behavior. The spiritual gifts, while they are very important, if their demonstration is not matched with love and it's not founded upon it, then they are lacking the primary evidence of the Holy Spirit in their midst. He says basically that spiritual action without love 
is meaningless. And so what Paul is doing in this chapter is he, he kind of breaks it down into various segments. It's hard to kind of see without a, kind of an initial observation. But in verses 1 through 3, what Paul is doing here is he's explaining the necessity of love, why one must love. And remember last week we talked as well in verses 4 through 7 where Paul talks about the character of love. What is the nature of love? How should it be demonstrated? He said, love is patient and it is kind. Well, this morning we're going to tackle the last few verses of this chapter, verses 8 through 13, where Paul's going to talk about the permanence of love, how love is something that is eternal. Now, we also have to make very clear that Paul isn't condemning spiritual gifts. So we're to widen the lens here in this chapter. Paul has been talking about these spiritual gifts and why they're to be used and how they're to be used in a healthy congregation. But what Paul is doing here in chapter 13 is he's putting this all into perspective. He's saying that these spiritual gifts need to be matched with an attitude and a character of love. And he he says, really, in essence, we must pursue love above all else because love is eternal and it is permanent. And so he begins once again in verse 8. He says, love never ends. And he says, as for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. So it's interesting, he says, love never fails. That can be translated, uh, love never ends or it's never defeated or it's never brought to the ground. The idea is it endures forever. And it's interesting here, he mentions three gifts, three charismata, which is a grace gift that God gives that he's referenced earlier in chapter 12. He says, prophecies, they will pass away, tongues, they will cease, and knowledge will pass away. What he's saying is that the spiritual gifts are temporary only for this present age, yet by contrast, love is eternal. Now, all the spiritual gifts, though vitally important for the church today, are suited only for, you could say, the time between the times, between Christ's ascension into heaven when he was, went into heaven as the disciples saw him go up into the air, and yet his second coming as well. And so this is what we think of today as the church age. That this age is when the gifts are present today, but there will be a time when the gifts are no longer needed. Now, a little bit later in this morning's message, I, I want to address how some Christians have misinterpreted this passage in order to justify their own case for cessationism, or the belief that some spiritual gifts do not operate today. I'll address that a little bit later in this morning's message. But Paul's point is to put spiritual gifts here into perspective. Yes, they are important, but they need to be situated within God's epic narrative plan of redemption for this entire world. The gifts, yes, they have a role for now, but their time of usefulness will pass away. They're only temporary for this present age. He continues on here in verses 9 and 10. He says, "...for we know in part and we prophesy in part." But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. So what Paul is doing here is he's providing a contrast. He's setting up kind of a now or then, a present reality versus a future a reality of how things were gonna, are going to happen. He says, for now, this present time, spiritual gifts are appropriate within the church. They're perfectly normal and should be fine within the church. But they're only partial because they only belong to this present age. Spiritual gifts, as we've learned over the last few weeks, edify the church. They build up the church as we eagerly await the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He mentions that in chapter 1, verse 7. But he gives this contrast. He said, this is what it is the present now. But then when, the, when we get to heaven, when we see Jesus face to face, and when Jesus is revealed, nothing will be partial then. The perfect will have come, and nothing will be incomplete at all. And so Paul is setting up this contrast, and he's actually going to provide several analogies here in the next few verses to explain the permanence of love. The first analogy is found in verse 11. 
he, this is the one of an, a child and an adult. He says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. So what Paul is saying is that the behavior of children is completely appropriate for childhood, but it's no longer appropriate when one becomes an adult. Now, I also want to just pause at this moment and make something clear as well. Paul is not calling tongues and prophecies childish. That's not what he's doing here. He's saying there is an age appropriateness to these things. We need to make that important clear, make that very clear before you. He's not calling the gifts, any of them, childish. He's saying there's an age appropriateness to these things. The spiritual gifts are appropriate to this present age, but when we get to heaven, as I mentioned, and see Jesus face to face, everything will be completely matured, and the gifts won't be necessary any longer. So tongues and prophecies would cease at that point. So that's the first analogy that he gives here, one of a child and adult. The second analogy is found in verse 2, one of a mirror. Look what he says here. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So just to give you a little bit of a historical background here with the city of Corinth, uh, they actually specialized and making some of the finest bronze mirrors at that time. So this analogy really would have connected well with the Corinthian people there because they were very familiar with that uh, building of mirrors within that particular city. And so what Paul is saying is when one looks in a mirror, yes, certainly it is an instrument of revelation, but it's an indirect one. It's not the same as face-to-face. You think maybe in our own time, maybe a better way of saying it would be this, a, a kind of a comparable analogy, that it would be the difference between looking at a photo on our phones versus seeing someone in person. Yes, the photo actually does show what the person looks like, but the photo isn't the real thing. You're not seeing them face to face. The photo merely points to a certain reality. The photo isn't the same thing as seeing them in person. And so what Paul is saying is a mirror is similarly and indirectly a a certain way of looking at things. It's not the the perfect face-to-face, but it is some element of revelation. And so what Paul is doing through these two analogies here, the analogy of a child and adult versus a mirror and face-to-face, is Paul is once again putting spiritual gifts into perspective. He's saying as good as all the spiritual gifts are, they are nonetheless only for the present. However, sacrificial love, by contrast, love that is patient and kind, that the Corinthians are actually lacking at that point, that is the more excellent way. Why? Because love is eternal. It is both present and future, and it will never come to an end. So this present partial existence will someday give way to something that is final and complete. And so we have to understand the greatest reality. Paul says here in the conclusion of the chapter in verse 13, he says, So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. What Paul is doing here is he's saying in this present age, All of us as Christians need to live by faith, by hope, and by love. We're called to be about that as Christians. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. We must abide in these three. But Paul adds here at the end, but the greatest of these is love. Now we have to ask ourselves, well, why would love be greater than faith or hope? The answer is because it is eternal. You think about it this way, faith, hope, and love must be present certainly with us, and they're all the enduring character marks of being a Christian, but if we think about faith and hope, they both anticipate something. Faith and hope both anticipate a future day. They look forward to a future moment. But when that day comes, namely when we see Jesus face to face, all our faith and hope will be met in Him. 
so they will no longer be needed. They are completely fulfilled. So unlike faith and hope, love carries on into heaven. That's what actually makes it distinct and unique. And interestingly enough, love is a property, character, trait of who God is. God is love. That's his nature. So love is eternal. And so Paul is saying, therefore, because all of these things are true, love must be the ultimate priority of our lives as Christians because it is eternal. Love must be essential to who we are and what we do every day of our lives because it is an appropriate reflection of the very character and nature of God. So Paul's point is is saying, well, spiritual gifts certainly are, are great, but they're limited to this age. But love is both now and forever. And so Paul's saying to the Corinthians, make love your aim. Don't overvalue tongues and undervalue love. Don't overvalue tongues, which was precisely the issue that was going on in that church, and undervalue love. Live in love as you use the gifts and graces that God gives you. Let it be governed by love. As I talked about last week, we mentioned that that the fruit of our lives should be the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And as we operate in the gifts that God gives us, if we're operating according to the Holy Spirit, love will be evident. There's nothing worse than somebody claiming to operating in a gift, but they do not have love. In fact, Paul says it's meaningless because love is the ultimate fruit, and one of the many fruits, but the ultimate fruit of a life that is filled with the Holy Spirit. First of all, one loving God, and secondly, loving other people as ourselves. You know, it's interesting as we think about this issue of love within the context of the spiritual gifts. I mentioned as we began this uh, mini-series on the spiritual gifts at the beginning of the year that I promised to share with you why I believe all the spiritual gifts apply today. And the reason why I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to actually take a few moments in this morning's message is because this passage that I just read here is often erroneously cited among certain cessationists or people who do not believe that certain gifts like tongues, prophecies, miracles, or healings function today. They ceased with the apostles and the early church, and they, they cite this passage as kind of a proof text and say, well, Paul says tongues and prophecies will cease, and so therefore they, they no longer exist today. And they talk about in verse 10 where the perfect comes, they interpret this to me when the canon of Scripture is closed. I want to share with you why I think this is a wrong interpretation. It's important anytime we go to Scripture that we do exegesis. Exegesis is mining out from the text what is actually within the text. Isogesis is reading into the text something that we have presupposed in our own mind. We want to do, as Christians, healthy exegesis and be able to pull out from the text what is there rather than taking presuppositions and imposing them on the text. And I believe that interpretation does a bit of isogesis. So I want to give you five reasons. This is kind of a a digression this morning, but I'm going to pull things back to this issue of love. Five quick reasons why I am not a cessationist, but rather a continuationist uh, regarding the spiritual gifts. And, you know, maybe this is new teaching. Maybe you've never heard this. Maybe you've heard some of these arguments before. But I just want to provide you five different reasons why I personally believe all the spiritual gifts are on the table today. The first reason is the Bible promotes all the spiritual gifts. Uh, we can't uh, cut out 1 Corinthians chapter 12 as we see the lists that are within there. The other lists are also in Romans chapter 12 and 1 Peter chapter 4. We have listings of gifts there. We can't cut out various passages of Scripture, such as in chapter 14, verse 1, which we're going to get to in a few weeks. He says, pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. So if we're interpreting 1 Corinthians 13 to mean the prophecies ceased, then what do you do with chapter 14, verse 1? Or what about chapter 14, verse 39? He says, so earnestly desire to prophesy, and do not forbid speaking in tongues. 
Actually, what kind of Bible case can you make to remove these passages from the Scripture? So I, I believe the Bible promotes all the spiritual gifts. The second reason, kind of on the flip side, is nowhere does the Bible say that some spiritual gifts will cease. Now, cessationists and try to interpret verse 10 here of chapter 13 to mean when the perfect comes, meaning when the canon of Scripture is closed. But clearly, as we look at the text with it itself, verse 12 actually answers the context of what is going on here in this chapter. He says, when we see Jesus face to face, we shall see face to face. And also, there's no way that Paul had the idea in his mind as he's writing this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that he's thinking of the canon of Scripture in mind when he penned these words. There's no way he had that in mind. There was, there was no way he would think about that. So in other words, anytime you go to a passage of Scripture, you have to ask, what, is this, what did this text mean to the original audience? And then the second question is, what does it mean to us today? There's no way that anyone in the first... In, in, in the Corinthian church would interpret that to mean when the canon of Scripture is closed. I love what A.W. Tozier said, great alliance pastor. He said, in view of much of today's dispensational teaching about Bible interpretation, the Bible, miracles of God, and the fullness of the Spirit, I must remind you that the Lord Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There's nothing that Jesus has ever done for any of his disciples that he will not do for any of his disciples today. Where did all the dividers of the word of the truth get their teaching that the gifts of the Spirit ended with the la when the last apostle died? When some men beat the cover off their Bible to demonstrate how they stand by the word of God, they should be reminded that they are only standing on their own interpretation of the word. So uh, once again, the second reason why I believe all the gifts apply today is not one place in Scripture does it say certain gifts will cease. In fact, if miracles were essential in the physical presence of Jesus, how much more so in his absence? And the closer that we're returning to, coming to the return of Jesus, the more we need to see the manifestation of his power among us. Amen? I believe that's the second, that, that's the second reason. We, nowhere in the Bible does it say that spiritual gifts will cease. Number three, the third reason why I believe that all the gifts apply today is that it is dangerous to separate the gifts and say that some are supernatural while others are not. Friends, all the spiritual gifts are supernatural. All the spiritual gifts are supernatural. Each requires a manifestation of the Holy Spirit in some way. And I think it's actually dangerous to say that only sign gifts are the workings of God's power. I think it's to, to actually diminish the workings of God's power in service and in teaching and encouragement and in all the others. I believe that God's power is manifest through each of the gifts. Now, certainly there are unique ways in which God shows himself strong in each of the gifts, but God gives grace in every one of them. The fourth reason why I believe that all the gifts are for today is that the purpose of the spiritual gifts are more than just authenticating the gospel message. Certain cessationists will argue these signs, gifts only happen in the Bible days to authenticate the Bible message. And I would say, yes, certainly spiritual gifts authenticated the Bible message, but they still do. They still authenticate the gospel message. And we can't reduce the purpose of spiritual gifts only to one of authentication. Could it be that God performs signs and wonders and miracles because of his love as well? That he had, and, and actually, we can't divorce God's activity with his character. And so if we reduce certain gifts to only one of authentication, we're missing the essence and the character of the reason why God performs these gifts, because of his love, because of his mercy, because of his sovereign purposes in each situation. I love what A.B. Simpson, we just heard his story here this morning. He says, were certain spiritual gifts meant merely to be transitory and special and temporary signs in connection with the introduction of Christianity into the world? Or were they part of the permanent endowment of the church? 
Does not the apostle tell us that the gifts and ministries were bestowed until we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ? Certainly the church has not reached that maturity, and if these gifts were needed then, they are needed still. He says the Alliance Movement stands for all the scriptural manifestations of the Holy Spirit since Pentecost. I wholeheartedly agree with him. In fact, this is one of the main reasons why I, I wanted to join. I felt the Lord calling up my wife and me to, to join the Alliance because we serve a Jesus who's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he continues to work. And the witness that we saw in these missionaries, God did mighty things through them. But it was his grace and it was his goodness. It was not these people. It, they were just simply the conduits by which his grace and power could flow through. And I don't know about you, but I want to continue, and I hope you want to be a conduit by which God's grace and power can flow to your workplace, to your family, to your neighborhood, to let his spirit work in us and through us to see people come to know Jesus Christ. Amen? Some will say, well, what about the gift of apostleship? Hasn't that ceased today? Aha, Pastor Tim, if, if that has ceased today, then, then uh, you cannot say all the gifts are for today. Uh, after all, there's no eyewitnesses today of Jesus' resurrection and they, as there were in the early church. And if that gift ceased, then you can't claim all the gifts are for today. Well, I, I would answer this, first of all, it depends on how you define the gift of apostleship. If you define it strictly as an eyewitness to Jesus and his resurrection, of course not. There are no, in that sense, apostles who are eyewitnesses to Jesus today in the same way that there are no first century Jewish Christians today. It's impossible. Yet if we understand apostleship as planting new churches going to places with the gospel where it has not yet been preached, to reach across cultures and to establish gospel presence and to raise up shepherds in those places? Yes, it does. And that's my perspective on that. The fourth, once again, I've gone a little bit around the, the barn here, but the, the fourth reason is that the, the, the reason why I believe that all the spiritual gifts are for today is it's more than just authenticating the gospel message. God does gifts for many different reasons in many different contexts. The fifth and final reason why I want to give you this morning why I believe that all the gifts are for today is that I believe cessation can breed an unhealthy fear and caution to the working of the Holy Spirit. I emphasize the word can. I'm not saying necessarily, but I believe it's quite possible. And I will also add that, yes, as Christians, we must be discerning. We must be discerning. We, we need to be discerning by the Holy Spirit what is going on under the umbrella of today of the working of the Holy Spirit to be discerning of the gifts, to be discerning of the Spirit that is operating behind those gifts. And Paul is advocating, certainly in the Corinthian church, some element of caution here because they had gone overboard and things were kind of tur turning into a little bit of a circus here. And so Paul's trying to rein them in and, and br bring them back in to be able to function in the way that God wants them to operate. And this is why he introduces this whole theme of love here in the first place. But when our overcaution turns to fear, turns to skepticism, or outright mocking, then this is very, very dangerous. And I've shared with you when I gave this uh, spiritual gift series from the outset, I think there's two dangers that, that, that can happen among Christians. First of all, we can say something is of the Holy Spirit when it is not. That's a danger. But the second one is saying something is not of the Holy Spirit when it is. So we need to be discerning and we need to ask for God's guidance and direction and be led of the Holy Spirit in every moment. And certainly, yes, it is embarrassing to see how some people behave under the name spiritual gifts and ministry of the Holy Spirit. But hear me well, Paul's answer to the abuse of spiritual gifts is not prohibition, but correction. It's not prohibition, it is correction. 
So what's my point in, in sharing all these things? I, I kind of went down this rabbit trail a little bit this morning because I promised I would share my reasons why I believe that all the gifts are on the table for today. But uh, several things I want to just emphasize uh, just to kind of bring it all together. My point in everything today is, first of all, say all the gifts are for today and that we need to exercise them while we wait for the coming of the Lord. And I'm also convinced that we must build the church with all the tools that God has provided. We need to do that. Yet we also need to remember that the gifts are temporary and they won't be needed in heaven. They're for this present age alone. What remains? Love. Love. Friends, does love define your character? Does, does love define your ministry? Does love define how you interact with your family members or so that person you emailed this past week or that person that just gets on your nerves at your workplace? Does love define how you talk about a person who might be considered your enemy or even behind their back? The essence of being a follower of Jesus is to be driven by love. Because we can do all these gifts, we can perform all. Jesus said you could do miracles, and he says on one day when people stand before him, Lord, we, we cast out demons in your name. Jesus said, depart from me, I never knew you. It's possible to focus on all the gifts of the Spirit and miss the Spirit of the gifts. My invitation and my challenge to each of us today, as much as we're going to dive into some of these issues of tongues in the next few weeks and some of, the, some of these other heavier things regarding abuses and so forth within the church, is to remind us that God is calling each of us to love. To love. To love our neighbor as ourself. And maybe right now the Holy Spirit is speaking to your mind about a person or a situation where you have not. And I, I'll be the first to admit I've had many situations in my life where I've not loved people the right way. I could probably find a way as I drive home from church today. Somebody will cut me off in traffic and I'm not living by love. <laughs> but the invitation, friends, is to focus our eyes on Jesus. To look in His beautiful face. And even though we do not see Him face to face now, he indwells us by the Holy Spirit, and He is a spirit of love. Love that, yes, at times will speak truth, even when it's uncomfortable. But love that is always meant to be redemptive, meaning that it brings people back to the heart of God. I'm going to just invite you to stand your feet at this time. We're going to conclude the service with a song, Driven by Love. And it's interesting that this links this idea of driven by love to missions, going to the ends of the earth, being ambassadors and heralders for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And some of us, we think certainly about the ends of the earth, but maybe as you interact with people this week, God is inviting you to be driven by love. And as we sing this song of worship before the Lord this morning, let us come with a willing heart to say, Lord, make me a person that recognizes your love and lives in your love, that I might be driven by your love to point people to Jesus. Let's sing this together.